Okay, we're now live on all of the platforms. Just wanted to welcome everybody to today's program. We will start here in about four minutes, and usually we open the room up early just to get people acquainted with our, our their sound and their volume and everything and learn a little bit about the process for today. Um, we do have time for questions, but today's program will end uh, with questions. So all sessions will proceed as usual, and then we'll take questions. We won't be taking questions after each session, but we do recommend that you take those, or you enter those questions as soon as you wish, um, and you can use the Q&A box for that. And in the Q&A box, we're allowing people to upvote and comment on questions. So if you see a question in the Q&A box that you would like addressed from somebody else in the group, feel free to click the thumbs up symbol. That'll allow us to take the most requested questions first. We may not have time to take all questions today. I know that last on Tuesday, we weren't able to take all the questions, I don't think, but um, we'll try to cover as many as we can in the time we have, uh, but we will be finishing at uh, 12.30, promptly at 12.30. So it'll be a quick paced program. That's why we recommend you ask those questions early so that your question is more likely to be addressed. Uh, on your screen, you'll see some slides from our programs and also some nice photos of some uh, relevant sites across the Northern California area. Uh, our partners for this program are uh, the McConnell Foundation, Shasta Historical Society, and Viva Downtown, and we thank them for their partnership. And we also wanted to thank our speakers today. We have about three minutes until the start of the program. Today's program will be closed captioned. I'm just now starting the closed captioning. You will have access to the transcript. If the closed captioning is a disruption, you can definitely hide it by clicking on the arrow next to the caption symbol. And you can also show it using the same button. For the chat today, uh, we do encourage active participation in the chat, but you can hide chat previews by clicking the arrow next to the chat symbol and uncheck the option that says show chat previews. That way, if you see chats in there disrupting your experience or disrupting you watching the speaker, you can always hide that, but we do still encourage you to uh, participate in chat as much as you wish. For questions, we recommend you use the Q&A box and that's where we'll take those questions. We may not catch any questions if they're coming in through the chat box. So again, we recommend the Q&A box. I'm now enabling chat for all participants. So let us know where you're coming from today. We have about 240 people signed up, so we'll get a lot more people coming in soon here. So let us know where you're all logging in from today, and we welcome you to, today, to today's program. We have about a minute before the start of the program. Hey, it's now 11 a.m. and so we're starting the program right now. I just wanted to welcome everybody to today's program. My name is John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. With me today is the Executive Director of the California Preservation Foundation, Cindy Heitzman. Before I turn it over to her, I'm going to briefly go over some of the uh, process for today. Today we will be taking questions at the end of the session, all sessions, I should say. Um, so please do ask your questions as soon as you wish, as soon as you think of it. Uh, you would use the Q&A box for that, but we won't be addressing them until the end of the sessions. Um, we also wanted to uh, thank our partners, and which I'm sure Cindy will do here in a second, but um, wanted to remind people that we have closed captioning enabled today. Raise your hand. You would click on the raise hand symbol if you would like to take a question in per or uh, um, ask a question in person. And uh, aside from that, we will be uh, taking recordings of today's program, you can access the recordings at our YouTube page by visiting youtube.com slash calpreservation or Facebook 
youtube.com slash CA preservation. You can access the recordings there uh, pretty much indefinitely. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our executive director and she will be introducing today's speakers. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this is the second part of a program that we're holding on a revitalizing um, communities through historic preservation. This program, um, if you were with us on, on um, Tuesday, bear with me because I'll be repeating some things, but um, for the benefit of those who didn't join us on Tuesday, this program is, is part of a collaborative effort with um, some community members representing uh, organizations in Redding, California. We were, were pleased to partner with them to plan this program over the most of the, the past year. Um, I'd like to thank them for their support and their interest. Uh, Heather Farquhar with the Shasta Historical Society, John Truitt with Viva Downtown Reading, and Shannon Phillips with the McConnell Foundation, representing the five northernmost counties in California. The reason this is so important to us is because as a statewide organization, our mission is to provide education and advocacy to all of California. And there are areas of California that, that need more assistance than, uh, than others. And so we are pleased to provide this program. It, it will be a quick overview of uh, financial incentives, today's program. Um, Tuesday's program is recorded as will this program will also be recorded so you'll be able to review it. We have attendees from across the country as you can see, Trish Neal from Anchorage, Alaska. We have folks from New York and Washington, Oklahoma, Canada. So we're very proud of our reach here. And um, uh, in order for us to do this work, we have um, support from sponsors. And I would like to give a special shout out to Wish Janie Elsner, our education program sponsor who uh, underwrites our educational programs throughout the year allows us to bring these programs at no cost. Um, all of the bios for our speakers are on the website, so we're going to make brief introductions, but do feel free to uh, go to our website to learn more about our speakers and how you can reach them. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar will be recorded, so if you miss a portion of it or have to leave or want to refer it to a friend, they will be recorded and available um, on our website about a week. So with that, I would like to start by introducing our first set of speakers. Um, Michael Phillips from the National Trust Community Investment Corporation and Lauren Cohen from the National Trust for Historic Preservation will cover uh, the federal historic tax credits and the uh, historic preservation fund and grants available to communities through that program. So uh, Michael and Lauren, um, you can begin now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Lauren Cohen. Uh, I am uh, pulling up my slides right now, uh, so everyone will be able to see that. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to speak with you about um, the Historic Preservation Fund and uh, the Historic Tax Credits. Um, I'm going to begin our time today uh, speaking about um, the Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, again, my name is Lauren Cohen. I'm the Associate Director of Government Relations uh, with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I'm based in Washington, D.C. Um, it is a beautiful fall day, and I'm excited to be here. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started, and then I will pass it off um, to Mike when I'm finished. So let's talk a little bit about the Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, I'm here to speak today about opportunities found in the HPF, uh, which is a critical program designed to protect our nation's historic resources that's been in place for the last 45 years. The HPF is a principal source of funding to implement the nation's historic preservation programs. Funding for the HPF comes from revenue generated by oil and gas development, actually, on the Outer Continental Shelf. So, um, it's really important to note that the HPF um, is, is a federal fund, but it's not supported by taxpayer dollars. Um, that's a really important distinction that uh, I like to make sure folks know about. So the HPF is comprised of funding for state historic preservation officers, CHIPOs, tribal historic preservation officers, TIPOs, 
and HPF competitive grant programs that support many historic rehabilitation projects, as well as creating well-paying well uh, preservation-related jobs and investments in local communities. Uh, the HPF is administered by the National Park Service, and it provides matching grants by formula for SHPOs and TIPOs, which are essential in supporting preservation initiatives across the nation. I know so many of you are um, very, very familiar with the Historic Preservation Fund, but I'm really excited to, to talk to you um, specifically today about these uh, competitive grant programs. Many of them um, are, are new within the past um, five to 10 years. So while funding for SHPOs and TIPOs has increased in recent years, um, the significant growth that we've seen in HPF funding has actually been for the competitive grant programs, which support brick and mortar job creation. So I'm gonna give some examples of HPF's grant programs and how they have helped breathe new life into long untold stories and how these grants are protecting places that form our cultural identity. Um, and it's important to note too that so many of these competitive grant programs are able to have reach into different constituencies that um, may or may not be able to be touched um, as thoroughly uh, through other historic preservation means. Um, so what you're seeing here is everything that's encompassed in the Historic Preservation Fund. Um, all of these competitive grant programs here, the African American Civil Rights Grants, the History of Equal Rights Grants, underrepresented community grants, um, HBCU grant programs, uh, Save America's Treasures, the Paul Broon Historic Revitalization Grants, and um, the Semi-Quincentennial Preservation Grants. That's looking specifically at our nation's uh, semi-quincentennial celebration coming up in 2026. Uh, so that's uh, a, a wonderful time to um, preserve our history um, for many generations to come. So that's with a, a specific eye at, at looking at that 2026 celebration. So I'm just gonna dive into a couple of these grant programs that I thought would be um, specifically interesting uh, to you all today and give you some uh, examples of these across the country. Uh, real quick, I wanted to show you the funding, the recent funding history for this. So um, while I said it's not supported by the taxpayer dollars, it does have to go through the annual appropriations process. Um, so, uh, these these numbers aren't necessarily so important for our discussion today, but I just did want to show you that um, we've seen um, steady uh, increases to the Historic Preservation Fund over the past couple of years, um, and uh, which has yielded our ask for fiscal year 2023 um, to be as high as $200 million, um, because I as I hope you'll see that the need certainly is there. And, um, and these uh, grant programs and the SHPOs and TIPOs um, are doing really incredible work. And so it would be great to see that work continued. So let's start off with the Paul Broon Historical Revitalization Grant Program. This competitive grant program fosters economic development specifically in rural communities. Um, so these are communities that are 50,000 people or less. Um, so this is through the rehabilitation of historic buildings in those small rural communities. The program provides a single grant that is then regranted into smaller amounts to individual projects as subgrants. So um, SHPOs, TIPOs, certified local governments or CLGs, and nonprofits can all apply for funding um, that would uh, turn that would in turn be subgranted to specific projects in rural communities in their jurisdictions. So eligible subgrant properties must be listed on the National Register of Historic Places or determined eligible for listing at the national, state, or local level of significance and located within communities, again, as I said, in with populations of 50,000 people or less. Um, so this is a really specific um, grant program. We've seen a lot of uh, wonderful success with it in Main Street programs. Um, but I just wanted to, to call out this, this recent grant, um, this recent Paul Broon grant opportunity um, that was awarded. So um, you'll see in the image here, um, built in 1864, Johnson Hall is the oldest opera house in Maine that is still used as a theater. It's located in Gardner, which is one of Maine's nationally designated Main Street communities. And Johnson Hall has been actually devastated by fires on three occasions and flooded twice. 
the project received uh, $243,000 for phase one, which includes exterior masonry repairs and window restoration to prevent the building from further deterioration. The project will also take advantage of the historic tax credit. So I just wanted to, to show that example. Uh, another example of a recent Paul Brune Historic Revitalization Grant awardee um, that I wanted to show here is um, Gallup Main Street Arts and Cultural District in Gallup, New Mexico, uh, is supporting two building owners who will improve the facades of the Gallup Coffee Company and the historic Grand Hotel. Gallup Coffee Company uh, shares a building with the historic El Moro Theater. Uh, and improvements will include window restoration, storefront rehabilitation, new lighting and signage, and a new color scheme. Uh, the building was constructed in 1928 and features painted um, uh, designs that uh, between the second floor windows reflecting significant Native American history there in Gallup, New Mexico. Another HPF grant program that might interest you is the African American Civil Rights Grant Program. Uh, there, uh, there was a great session um, recently that I, that I attended about oral histories with the National Park Service um, and the Department of the Interior um, that discussed this particular grant program. And it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, this competitive grant program documents uh, interprets and preserves sites that are uh, related to African-American struggle to gain equal rights as citizens in this country. Uh, projects are split into two different categories for this grant, physical pre preservation projects and history projects. So the physical preservation projects are literally for the repair of historic properties. The history grants are more for interpretive work like exhibit design or even historical research. Um, states, tribes, local governments, and nonprofits are all eligible to apply for this grant program. Um, Non-federal matching uh, share is not required, uh, but preference will be given to applications that show community commitment through a non-federal match and partnership collaboration. Um, applications typically open in the summer, so this is something to consider um, looking for in summer 2023. Uh, this example I wanted to show you here is uh, the, from the Louisiana Office of Tourism. It received a $50,000 grant to complete the design and installation of the first round of Louisiana Civil Rights Trail markers. So that's one of the markers that you see there. Um, so this certainly would fall into that um, history grant side, not the um, physical preservation grant side. Um, so the Louisiana Civil Rights Trail interpretive markers are being placed at sites that played a significant role in the national civil rights movement. Uh, so this is just uh, another example of how those grants can be distributed. Um, one other thing I wanted to highlight for you too is that after many years, we're actually seeing congressionally directed spending or earmarks. That's another, that's what uh, earmarks are being called now, but we're seeing, um, congressionally directed spending come back uh, into play uh, at the federal level. So it's a return to the appropriations process and it's extended into the Historic Preservation Fund as well. So for the first time in the program's history, um, there were over $15 million sp uh, specified within the Historic Preservation Fund for 36 congressionally directed projects or earmarks in 19 states at the request of both Democrats and Republicans. This is uh, definitely bipartisan. You're seeing lots of um, congressionally directed spending requests coming in from both sides of the aisle all over the country. So roughly a third of these projects, um, a, a third of those congressionally directed spending projects that I, that I said, um, roughly a third of them support diverse histories, including four tribal nations, Native Hawaiians, African Americans, and Jewish congregations as well. Um, so here's a couple examples from fiscal year 22. Um, that's, the, that's the fiscal year that we're in until tomorrow, technically. Um, but uh, right here, what you're seeing is the 1853 neoclassical Wheeling Center Market in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, that was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1975. Um, senator Shelley Moore Capito, um, a Republican, the Republican uh, senator from West Virginia, uh, helped direct $150,000 to the West Virginia State Historic Preservation Office to help with preservation efforts here. 
Um, that's a really fabulous um, use of that program. Uh, the second project I wanted to highlight um, is the Lyceum Theater in Clovis, New Mexico. Senator Ben Ray Luan secured $500,000 for the theater, which was built in 1919, and it will go undergo restoration, which is expected to help support downtown revitalization and help night, nightlife return to, uh, to this community um, in Clovis, New Mexico. The Lyceum Theater is on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so this funding, as I said, known as congressionally directed spending, used to be ca called earmarks. Um, it's called congressionally directed spending in the Senate and community project funding in the House. Of course, the House and Senate have to have different names for things, um, but it does mean the same thing. Congressionally directed spending or community project funding, that's what we're talking about here. Um, so in order to pursue this kind of funding, it's incredibly important to build a relationship with your members of Congress. Um, you have to show that relationship, show the need for a specific project in your community or state um, and, and start that process now. Um, let them know the preservation priorities that you have and why it matters to the communities that they represent. Um, I, I say start that process now if you haven't started building a, a relationship with your um, federal elected officials because requests are due to offices in uh, the spring for consideration for the following fiscal year. So for instance, um, for fis fiscal year 2023, requests were due to offices on April 10th of this year. So keep that in mind as you think about fiscal year 2024 and beyond, if you're interested in pursuing this kind of funding. Um, we don't know for sure if uh, congressionally directed spending is going to um, stay in perpetuity. It, it could go away again. Um, earmarks uh, were, were around for a good long time and then they went away. Um, so they're back for now and it's a wonderful source of funding to try to pursue um, if you've got a project in mind, if you've got a really good relationship with your elected official, um, it's another avenue to pursue for funding through the Historic Preservation Fund. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over uh, to my colleague, uh, Mike Phillips, and he's going to talk about um, historic tax credit. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much, Lauren. Hopefully I can get my screen shared properly here. Um, you just go through. All right. I assume everything is, is good there and everybody can see my screen. Thank you for this opportunity to connect with everyone and share some information on the historic tax credit. Uh, the historic tax credit is a critical tool for both Main Street and urban areas. Uh, it was birthed out of the preservation movement um, and Americans decided it is important to uh, preserve and to incentivize preserving uh, America's history. Um, and the historic tax credit was birthed out of that movement. And why do we need a historic uh, tax credit? Um, it's challenging to do historic preservation. Um, it's lots of times there are financing challenges in doing that, uh, but there's, there's also risk involved with those projects. Uh, banks tend to lend less to those projects. Uh, and there is a need for incentive to help incentivize uh, historic preservation in communities. So just a real quick overview of the program. Um, since its inception, it's, it's re, the credit has been used in order 40, over 46,000 projects. Uh, it's, it's generated um, federal tax revenue, more federal tax revenue than actually credits. Um, <clears throat> We're now looking at almost 200 billion in um, investment in historic uh, projects across the country since the 70s. And about 3 million jobs have, have resulted um, from this. In California in the past 20 years, over 200 projects have, have used the historic tax credit. Um, and California is really on the cusp of a lot of historic rehabilitation you have buildings reaching the 50 year mark. Uh, so a lot more buildings will be eligible. This, pr this program is not just for big projects, but it's also for small projects. I think 45% of all the projects in 2021 were in towns of populations of, of under 100,000. 
Um, and also half of the projects every year are less than a million dollars in total cost. So this is not just a large catalytic project uh, incentive. This is an incentive that comes to Main Street and is used on Main Street. Uh, so what is the historic tax credit? The historic tax credit encourages private investment in historic buildings. It's a market-driven incentive. Um, the credit attracts capital, and many times these, these uh, buildings are vacant or underutilized and in serious need of rehab uh, and transformation. Um, the federal government offers a 20% credit ap applied to the qualified rehabilitation expenses. So those are QREs, uh, and it has to be a certified historic structure. So it needs to be on the National Register for Historic, Pre historic Places. The credit is distributed over five years. So once the building is placed into service, you get a, you get um, a 4% credit of the QREs for five years, uh, starting once the building is placed in service. Uh, to receive the historic tax credit, the building must be rehabilitated according to the Secretary's Interior uh, Rehabilitation Standards. And you have to go through the approval process, which is the part one, two, and three process. The part one uh, determines whether your building is indeed historic. The part two goes over the planned rehabilitation and you work with your SHPO and National Park Service to determine that you're meeting the standards. And then the, uh, the part three is uh, showing that you did what you had planned and you've placed the building uh, in service. Um, and, and this credit is available for commercial properties, not, not residential. Um, one, one interesting aspect uh, of the credit and historic rehab industry is that 37 states have a state historic tax credit, including California, and Cindy will get into that, but that leverages uh, a lot more ability to rehab buildings. Um, you see um, the most successful uh, states with historic rehabilitation have a state historic tax credit and it's combined with the federal. Um, the HTC is by far the largest federal investment in historic preservation. So it really is uh, preserving buildings across, across the country, but it's also a market-driven incentive. So who uses HTCs? So HTCs, uh, the building owner, property owner, um, the historic tax credits can be carried back one year and carried forward 20 years. Uh, C corporations use them, large banks, regional banks, financial institution, insurance companies, Fortune 500 com companies, um, all use historic tax credits uh, at, and, and take, many times take the credit themselves. Um, real estate professionals have a special exemption to use the, the credit. So you see a lot of real estate professionals around the country, especially that's how a lot of smaller projects get done um, through real estate professionals. Um, and then individuals with passive income of less than 200,000, uh, there are passive income restrictions that, that limit that. That was done in the uh, tax bill in 1986. Um, but then there's also this aspect of syndicating and monetizing historic tax credits. So for larger projects, you see national and regional investors partner with developer, developers and provide equity to projects. Uh, they typically exit the transaction uh, after five years. Uh, in smaller projects, it's harder to get a third party or uh, an outside investor to come into those projects because there are um, professional fees involved. Uh, accounting fees and attorney fees to structure um, the deal. Uh, but we do see banks uh, come in as an investor if they've already been involved with the loan uh, on an existing project. <clears throat> and they may be interested in both the state and the federal um, credits with the project. And also Community Reinvestment Act credit is a driver for banks to partner in these projects. So uh, there, different specifications that uh, the project re requires, but if they meet certain specifications, uh, they would uh, allow the um, bank investor to receive Community Reinvestment Act credit, which is very important to banks. <clears throat> uh, 
So that's basically just an overview of how the credit works. Um, if you're interested in more information, this is just kind of a quick 30,000 foot view of the credit, uh, but please dig into more information. Here are some resources, technical preservation services at the National Park Service has a lot of guides on, on uh, the historic tax credit. The California SHPO's office um, has a lot of good information. And also when it comes down to, to see if you are um, eligible as a taxpayer or the, the, the thought process you have for making um, one of these re rehab projects go forward using the historic tax credit, check with the IRS uh, website. Um, and if you search historic preservation FAQs, you will see the historic rehab FAQs come up and there's a lot of great information that can answer a lot of questions, technical aspects of your situations and examples uh, to help determine if the historic tax credit is, is a good way forward for uh, your rehabilitation. So uh, I'm the director of public policy for National Trust Community Investment Corporation. So I, I have to talk um, advocacy before I hand it off to Cindy. Um, so many of you really helped save the historic tax credit in 2017. It was um, threatened for elimination and actually in the house, it was eliminated in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act bill. Uh, however, due to advocates across the nation and many advocates in, in California uh, were there standing with us uh, advocating to restore the uh, historic tax credit in the Senate bill. We were successful in doing that. Uh, we did get a little bit of a haircut in that we do have a 20% credit, but it's now spread over five years. Um, and the past 10 years, there have been, you know, quite a few challenges in the market uh, relating to pricing of credits. The value of the, of the credit has diminished. Um, and that's been due to some federal policies, uh, IRS revenue procedures, spreading the credit over out, out over five years has diminished some of the value of it. And then you have issues related to COVID, cost of materials skyrocketing, uh, cost of labor, supply chain issues. Um, so there, there has been challenges in the market and we have some ways to improve the historic tax credit. The historic tax credit has not been positively improved since uh, 1986. And so these are some provisions in the bill, the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act that would uh, bring more value to the credit, make the credit easier to use, make more projects eligible um, and allow something as simple as nonprofits to use the, the uh, historic tax credit uh, in an easier way. If, if your member of Congress is uh, not on this bill yet, we ask you to, um, ask them to co-sponsor. And so uh, Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act is known as HTC Go. Uh, I'd be happy to help anybody advocate if you're interested uh, in getting your members of Congress on the bill. Um, so what's the outlook for the legislative act outlook for this? Um, there may be a busy lame duck session after the elections, uh, especially if the Republicans gain the House. So there's a possibility of some of these provisions going into a year-end bill. And just as I said before, um, we encourage you to reach out to your members of Congress and um, ask them to co-sponsor this legislation. I will say specifically for Main Street, this bill bumps the credit from 20% to 30% permanently. Uh, so that would be a very powerful um, provision uh, if, those, if that could get passed uh, for Main Street rehabilitations. <clears throat> And with that, I'll hand it back over to Cindy. If you like, thank you, Lauren. Um, so my um, portion of the, the talk today is, is about the California tax credits. So um, I am going to share my screen. And this will be just kind of a brief uh, overview of state tax credits. Um, I'm very proud that California is one of the 30 plus states to have enacted a tax credit. It was something that um, took a long time. It didn't happen overnight. In fact, the first bill that was a uh, tax credit bill that was introduced was in 2000. And we worked 
So we went at this four times and we finally got the bill passed in 2019. Um, our sponsor was uh, Senate Pro Tem Tony Atkins and she sponsored it when she was the Speaker of the Assembly back in 2013. So we have a real partner in preservation there. And we're very proud of our, of our relationship with her. Just noticed my screen is in advancing here. Um, so the tax credit uh, effort was really a collaborative effort with a number of partners. All of our, our preservation partners from around the state worked at this. And if you were um, tuned in to yesterday's program, Don Ripkema mentioned that these bills, tax credits are really founded in economics and in, in facts and statistics. And, and this is what we had to do to get this bill passed is really, it's not to get the bill passed, but to just to get the bill introduced. They had to come up with fighting. So we had to, to do our research to address several points, how many jobs are created, how the state tax uh, revenues and economic um, activities in the state was going to be enhanced by the bills and so forth. And I just wanna share something with you that came across my email as Mike and Lauren were speaking, and it was the National Park Services Annual Report on the historic tax credits. Last year, 2021, 135,000 jobs were generated and over 8 billion in investments in 2021 alone through the historic tax credits, the federal tax credits. So these are the sort of information that we track and it's needed in order to get uh, bills like this off the ground. So we also have to, in, in the, um, through the bill itself, track this information. So where we are now with the bill or a little bit about the bill and how it's structured is that there's several uh, portions to the bill. One is the 20% tax credit for qualified expenditures, rehabilitation expenditures for income producing properties. Um, there's also a tax credit for owner occupied uh, properties. Um, there's an annual cap of 50 million that has to be allocated every year but there is an additional 5% bonus to that 20% credit, but it's, it's available for five specific types of properties that are listed here, surplus properties, uh, low-income housing, if low-income housing is being created through adaptive reuse um, or being maintained, there's a 5% a bonus. BRAC zone, so uh, decommissioned military bases are eligible for the 5% um, tax credit or investment or redevelopment within those areas. Transit-oriented developments and census tract properties can take advantage of the 5% bonus, so that would be a total 25% tax credit, and this is a state tax credit. So um, the other um, unique um, aspect of the bill is that we do have a residential component. So um, there is a $2 million set aside out of that $50 million for uh, residential properties. And I'll talk to you about some of the criteria about that. Um, there is an income, uh, a, a combined income criteria for each household. Um, the nature of the work is restricted to specific types. And there is a limit on the number of times that credit can be um, used. Um, I would also note that um, Within the, um, the tax credit, there is um, a set aside. So of that 50 million, 40 million is available for the large uh, commercial projects. 8 million is set aside for projects that are less than a million. So that could be a lot of little Main Street um, type of rehabs. And then uh, 2 million is again, set aside for the residential program. Uh, it is a first come first serve basis. And uh, in order for the building or the project to qualify, the building must be what's called certified historic structure. That is, it's listed on the California Register of Historic Places. And any uh, remainder of that 50 million pot is carried over to the next year. As I mentioned, there was limitations on, on the residential credit uh, based on the combined um, household income. Um, it is a, uh, the combined um, income cannot exceed $200,000. And the work is, is generally limited to have habitability repairs. That is, you need a new roof, foundation, siding repair, window restoration. It is, cannot be used for 
um, kitchen remodels, bathroom remodels. Um, it, it is specific on how it is used. And the intention there was to, to allow homeowners who, who have lower earned the lower income ranges, um, allow them to use these funds to um, maintain um, their home, extend the life of the home, allow people to stay in their homes. And this was something that Senator Atkins felt very strongly about, and uh, she was a big proponent of this provision in the code. Um, and uh, another important fact about the, the state tax rate is it has to be allocated annually. The bill when, when adopted or signed by the governor in 2019 was a five year bill. So it sunsets in five years. Unfortunately, um, COVID hit and everything was put on, on hold. Uh, we did secure funding for the bill in 2021 for the year, but we're still waiting on a couple of other measures, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, part of that bill was that um, in addition to the five-year sunset, as I mentioned, the, the $50 million has to be allocated annually. And as I mentioned before, any surplus can be rolled over into the next year. Um, so there is this two-step process for review. Um, the Office of Historic Preservation would review uh, any applications for the tax credits, and it would also be reviewed by the California Tax Credit Allocation um, Committee. And what is important in that is that, that these economic indicators have to be tracked. So there has to be a process for determining or establishing how, how many jobs, what the, the revenues uh, impact to the state and, and local jurisdictions is, and is there use of any other incentives in the, in, the, um, in the project, like federal tax credits. And that's the, really the beauty of the state tax credit it is cumulative. So you can apply for or receive federal tax credits and state tax credits, which creates a huge financial incentive for, for projects. Um, just a little uh, graph here on, on how, the, uh, how state tax credits impact uh, rehabilitation projects um, when combined with federal tax credits. In Texas, um, the year that it was uh, implemented, in I believe it's 2015, you can see here the um, number of, of um, applications that came in. It's increased from 31.5 million, went up to 112 million in 2018, and um, 2019, 51.9 compared to California that doesn't have, a, at the time of this, did not have state tax credit. Um, you see the comparison. Traditionally, uh, California has fewer um, tax credit projects, but they're larger or they have, there's more, um, uh, their higher value in, in terms of their qualified rehabilitation expenditures. So um, there's a quote from Don Ripma um, below that they, in order of magnitude, there's a 40 to 60% increase in the use of the federal credit when it's combined with the state credit. So it's a very powerful economic incentive um, for um, rehabilitation and preservation of historic resources. And just a brief update on where we are today. Um, the bill was passed in 2019. Uh, funding was stalled in the budget. Again, I mentioned it has to be allocated annually. Uh, we uh, lobbied and worked with Senator Atkins staff to get funding for 2021, but in order for the bill for the tax credits to be effective, you need uh, the application. Um, the application process has to be established and the regulations have to be written. And that's where we're at today. We're still waiting for the regulations to be completed. Um, the State Office of Historic Preservation is working with the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee to um, to finalize the draft of the regulations. They, they have to work together. The, the regulations or the process has to be in sync with each other in order for this to work. So I think we're closing in on it. The estimates that I had from um, conversations with the state, uh, the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee was that they're looking at about two months to have the process wrapped up. The, once the, the regulations are drafted, they have to go out for public comment. So there's a review period, but we're very hopeful that these will be in place by the end of the year and we'll be able to see um, tax credit out, uh, applications 
um, submitted and get this program going. I would also mention that when we went for the funding last year, um, Senator Atkins also extended the sunset date of the bill by a year. So we want to work with her and um, to see that this bill is extended. We are very confident that it's going to do everything that we intended it to do, and that is to stimulate the economy and to preserve historic buildings, create jobs, and um, ensure that our heritage is protected. So that was a whirlwind presentation, but um, feel free to reach out to us if you have any information. We'll keep people posted on the developments once the rules, the regulations are drafted. We are planning to have programs on this. So um, you'll be hearing more from us. So I am going to turn this over to Nils for his um, presentation on the Mills Act. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nels Youngborg. I work for Chattel Incorporated. Uh, and today I'll be speaking about the Mills Act. Let me start this presentation mode. There we are. Um, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, and uh, really excited to be invited to talk about these exciting financial incentives, uh, especially um, this one, the Mills Act, uh, which is special just for the state of California. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, my name is Nels Jungborg. I work for Chattel Incorporated Historic Preservation Consultants. Uh, we're based here in Southern California, but we work um, all over uh, the region and the state. Uh, today, I'll be taking you through um, a, a very quick introduction of what the Mills Act is. I'll have uh, a couple different parts, talk about the background of the program, guidelines of the program. We'll talk a little bit about scopes of work. Uh, monitoring enforcement. I'm also going to add in a little bit more about how uh, savings is calculated so we can kind of demystify that a little bit. Um, and hopefully you'll come out with a better understanding of what this Mills Act is, um, how it's enforced and, and valued. So the Mills Act is um, different than other types of tax credits in that it uh, allows property owners to receive a potential property tax reduction um, when they sign a contract to rehabilitate their historic properties. And I'll reiterate this many times, in no way does the Mills Act guarantee a tax savings. It is a potential tax savings. Uh, it was introduced in the early 1970s, but most programs throughout the state weren't really established until um, the 1990s. Uh, it is California's leading financial incentive for historic properties. Uh, it the Mills Act is a contract, and it's signed between a property owner and a municipality. Uh, once it's signed by the property owner, it uh, follows that property through all owners into the future as long as the Mills Act contract is active. Um, it applies to all types of taxable properties. Um, taxable properties can include single family, multifamily, commercial, industrial, um, also recreational in the city of Los Angeles. Theaters are uh, zoned as recreational, identified as recreational types of properties. Uh, and there are some theaters that um, have a Mills Act contract. So uh, specifically, this Mills Act is meant to incentivize the restoration, rehabilitation, maintenance of importantly qualified historical properties. Um, and it's meant to promote appreciation of the architecture of the region. So the benefit of the program, let's get down to it. Uh, it is based on uh, uh, property taxes um, and it's based on the income potential of the property um, rather than most recent sales or transfer of value of the property. Um, it is a fictitious amount that is uh, calculated by determining the uh, uh, net income of the, of the property, net income, even though the, the owners might live there, it might, might not be rented, the income is determined, it's multiplied by a capitalization rate, and then the, a, a new value is produced. Um, so it's based on the lowest uh, comparison between three different ways that as, uh, assessors in California val value properties, and that would be the Proposition 13 value, the estimated fair market value, 
fair market value and then the Mills Act value if you are in a Mills Act uh, living in a, uh, or own a Mills Act property. The expected tax savings that any owner receives as part of this program is meant to offset um, substantial rehabilitation of a historic property. And it in no way is meant to be a gift of public funds uh, to uh, provide to property owners of historic buildings. No, it is really based on a specific scope of work that is included in a contract and often updated through time in order for the city to help uh, ensure that the property owners remain compliant with the obligations of the Mills Act contract. Uh, once again, there is no guarantee of any tax savings. Uh, since it's based on an income potential and then the assessor has three different values to choose from, uh, there, it is often the case that the lowest value may be the Proposition 13 value. And if that is the case for a property owner, they're not receiving a financial benefit from being in the program, yet they are still liable uh, for the obligations of the contract. Here's an example, uh, a SNP of a um, Mills Act Notice of Assessed Change Value. Uh, at the bottom, I wanna draw your eyes uh, to the three values that the assessor here has identified, the Proposition 13 value, fair market value, and a Mills Act value. Uh, then the third is the actual enrolled value that the property owner will, th that's the value of the property that will be used in order to determine taxes. Uh, so in this case, you can see that they are receiving a benefit from being in the Mills Act program because the Mills Act value is the lowest of the three, and that is the enrolled value. So, Uh, before I mentioned that um, uh, this program, and I wanted to make sure I send in ultimately the California Code, National Register Historic District, uh, second, listed in any type of state, city, county, local, official register of historic places. Um, however, once a municipality creates their own Mills Act ordinance that would uh, regulate how that municipality would, would run their Mills Act, they can refine the um, qualified historical properties even more. Uh, many municipalities limit qualified historic properties to those that are only listed in the local register. Um, and oftentimes that's used as a strategy in order to make sure that the properties that are applying for the Mills Act program have actually come through the municipality's designation program, uh, you know, gone through a public process in the city, um, you know, already uh, familiar with that city, um, city, city staff and city resources. Um, and, and that's a, a choice that a lot of municipalities have made. Uh, let's talk more about the contract. So the provisions of this contract, uh, it runs for a minimum of 10 years. However, it is renewed annually for the minimum term every year. So basically, it's a, it's, it's a running target of 10 years that moves through time. So as a year is dropped off the, the term of 10 years, um, a new 10, uh, 10 year term is, is created. Um, so every year, it, it, it uh, uh, recreates itself as another 10 year contract. Uh, and as I said before, these contracts are transferred to new owners when a property is sold. It, it follows with the land. Uh, next, uh, inspections are required. Um, as part of California code, uh, that the interior and exterior uh, should be inspected by the municipality prior to a new agreement and every five years thereafter. And this is to determine compliance. Uh, properties must be maintained in accordance with the Secretary's standards in the California Historical Building Code. Uh, you'll be hearing a little bit more about what the California Historical Building Code is after this. However, uh, just to talk about that, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about the Secretary's standards a little bit later in this presentation. Um, last but not least, uh, municipalities may charge a fee uh, that would cover the reasonable cost of providing the service of administering these contracts. So not only would that include a application fee, uh, that would cover the costs of staff uh, reviewing and uh, engaging the property owner uh, uh, pre-contract. Post-contract, the municipality may charge fees in order to continually uh, inspect and work with the property owners. But once again, the enabling legislation does uh, have a, um, 
uh, a requirement that it doesn't exceed the reasonable cost of providing the service. So it's important that cities do do fee studies in order to prove what the reasonable cost would be in order to maintain this program. Uh, I'll draw your eyes over to the picture on this page. Um, this is technically a landscape feature and um, not all landscapes are covered in a mills at contract. Now, this obviously is a, a historic resource at this property. Hopefully it's identified as a character defining feature. Um, however, municipalities sometimes only uh, review um, a certain aspects of the property. And we always highly encourage uh, municipalities to cover the site and the property as part of their Mills Act uh, review, uh, because oftentimes there are different types of landscape features, hardscape, uh, even certain types of historic vegetation that should be maintained in our character defining features. Contract termination. So there are two different ways that contracts end. The first is called a contract non-renewal. Uh, either the property owner or the municipality may serve a letter of non-renewal. And basically what that means is as soon as a letter of non-renewal is served, as soon as the anniversary of that uh, contract comes about, the, uh, a new 10-year term is not added on to the, uh, to the term of the contract. It's basically, it runs out for a term of 10 years and then the, uh, the contract will end. Uh, however, uh, you know, during that period, the contract is still very much enforced. Uh, they are still receiving a potential benefit from being in the program. Uh, the obligations of the contract are, are still in place, even after a letter of non-renewal is submitted while the contract is winding down over the next 10 years. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, either the property owner or municipality may uh, submit these types of letters of non-renewal. The next is a contract cancellation, and this can only be administered by the municipality. Uh, if the property owner fails to rehabilitate the property um, or uh, alters the property in a way that is a substantial adverse change, uh, it may incur a cancellation of the contract. Cancellations of contract have a penalty fee equal to 12.5% of the current fair market value of the property, not the Proposition 13 or the Mills Act value, but the fair market value of the property, which is often um, the highest of the three values that I showed you before. Um, a contract cannot be canceled without a public process. Uh, it can't just be a director's uh, signature or a staff signature uh, as written into California code. Uh, a, a notice has to be given and a public hearing on the matter must be held um, in, in order to uh, uh, con cancel a contract. Um, other than contract cancellation, um, municipalities may enjoin a property owner in order to enforce the contract, and that is also written into the code. Um, so there are other opportunities for a municipality to enforce a contract and ensure a property owner does rehabilitate the property um, without submitting letters of non-renewal or contract cancellations. Um, a, a Chattel Incorporated recently completed a program Mills, uh, Mills Act program assessment for the city of Los Angeles, which has uh, 930 Mills Act contracts. Uh, and as part of that process, we uh, sent out a survey to municipalities that manage Mills Act programs. And one thing we found out is that there's never been a contract cancellation in the state of in, in the Mills Act program in the state of California. Uh, there's a few programs that have come close to uh, canceling a contract. One of those is the city of Los Angeles. They held multiple public hearings and in the final public hearing, the owner did uh, agree to the terms of the contract and to rehabilitate the property and the property has since been rehabilitated. Um, there are is one other example of a property that had a Mills Act. However, it, it uh, the, the Mills Act contract actually wasn't properly administered. So uh, a court said there actually was no Mills Act contract. And so it actually wasn't canceled. It, it was just kind of an annulled. It was kind of a strange process. However, um, I just want to make sure everyone knows that contract cancellation is definitely not something that municipalities want to do. They want to keep people in this program. It's a great way for the city to communicate um, and uh, also for uh, property owners to receive a benefit and to rehabilitate their properties. 
Um, really quick hit on condominiums. Um, this has come up to be a, quite an issue with the Mills Act program. Uh, so condominiums are often one building and many property owners. As you can see on the left is the uh, is the Eastern Columbia building in uh, downtown Los Angeles, very beautiful building. Um, however, it was part of an adaptive reuse project and now it is uh, uh, condominiums. Um, so the character defining features for condominiums are likely on the exterior of the sites and not within the shared spaces or in the individual units. Uh, so it's very important that condominium properties have 100% uh, enrollment of owners um, in order to be a part of the Mills Act program, because oftentimes, if just one owner is receiving a Mills Act contract and a benefit, how can that benefit actually uh, benefit the character defining features of the property? Uh, not only are there homeowners associations, but there's commercial properties uh, that also are uh, commercial condominiums. And once again, it needs to be 100% participation, or it really doesn't make sense, uh, or, or it really does become a gift of public funds, because in no way can one owner or uh, a few owners um, uh, provide enough money to rehabilitate an entire property without other owners also contributing. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a dilemma that we have been working on with a few different uh, municipalities that we work with. Um, however, I did wanna say something that adaptive reuse projects are wonderful. They're prioritized, especially in Los Angeles. Um, there's no displacement of existing housing and it's a boon to downtown areas to rehabilitate them. Uh, but oftentimes these adaptive reuse projects are, become condominiums. Um, so uh, a couple of opportunities for Mills Act contracts and condominiums, um, if a property has an existing contract and is uh, either uh, zoned a specific way, either an apartment building or uh, an adaptive reuse project of a commercial industrial building um, to offer a new contract that would supersede the existing contract. Uh, and that contract would have 100% uh, 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 property owner participation um, and uh, the city would uh, issue a, a non-renewal notice for the previous uh, contract. Um, also another, suggestion would be that the homeowners association be the signatory for all new contracts because they are the ones who are actually going to be managing the uh, rehabilitation of the property planning it also homeowners associations typically um, are a great way to do it because owners might change uh, co contact information might change if there's a signatory on the property uh, that person might not continue to be there so having the homeowner association um, uh, being the signatory is, is, the, is the biggest benefit for condominium properties uh, moving into the application, um, in order to be a part of the Mills Act program, you would need to apply. Uh, now, uh, I have on screen uh, eight different aspects of an application that we find are uh, uh, in all different types of uh, requirements from municipalities. So first, typically a contract uh, application uh, telling uh, demographic information about the property owners, the property uh, information, contact information. Um, there is usually an application fee, um, and this is in order to make sure that the reasonable cost of administering this program uh, doesn't uh, dip into being subsidized by the general fund of the city, and this can be a program that can help support itself. Uh, oftentimes, copies of legal descriptions are needed in order to ensure that the uh, um, people listed on the application are the actual owners of the property. Uh, Oftentimes there's reports that are required. So um, most often an architectural report with photographs, oftentimes by a qualified uh, uh, architect or contractor is important in order to really prove that the property needs significant investment in order to be a part of this program. Other reports that might be needed, for example, the city of Orange requires a termite report be submitted. Uh, city of Pasadena requires a electrical report be submitted. Uh, the city of Los Angeles requires that if any structural work is listed in a rehabilitation plan, that a structural engineer report is included in the application just to justify that work and make sure that um, significant work is considered when uh, applying for these programs. Uh, the next two have to do with a rehabilitation plan. Now, this is key. All contracts have an exhibit attached to them um, that is a rehabilitation plan that often spans 10 years. Um, 
this rehabilitation plan is made a part of the contract. It is a part of the obligations of the owner. So it includes a list of the substantial rehabilitation and maintenance that they will plan on doing, as well as a cost estimate for what it might cost. Um, lastly is some sort of financial analysis worksheet that uh, would allow the owner to identify the estimated savings that they would receive at least in the first year. And, and municipalities often extrapolate that uh, and try to calculate an estimate of savings over 10 years so that they can figure out what the estimated fiscal loss might be over 10 years, uh, because this is a property tax savings that um, would come out of any sort of revenue funds that uh, the city might receive. So secretary standards, as mentioned before, all of these contracts uh, are subject to work being completed according to the secretary standards. There are four standards. Uh, however, the, the rehabilitation standard is the one that is most often used for the Re Mills Act program. Uh, and it is actually the first of all the rehabilitate of, of all the secretary standards uh, that were created. Uh, preservation, restoration, reconstruction were actually added on in the 90s. Rehabilitation is different than the other types of uh, that we just discussed, the restoration, reconstruction, and preservation, uh, because not only is rehabilitation the act or process of um, repairing uh, and restoring and even reconstructing, but it also allows a property to be put back into a specific use um, that may require some sort of alteration or removal. Um, so rehabilitation is a type of, uh, is written under the secondary standards as a way to encourage the important preservation that needs to happen to a property, but allow it to change through time. Uh, so the emphasis is on retaining and repairing historic materials, uh, of course, to avoid removal, alteration of any types of character defining features. Um, it makes sure that any type of work doesn't create a false sense of historic development. And what that means is that um, new additions to properties using the rehabilitation standard must have a differentiation between the new and the old. So it doesn't look like the new has always been a part of the property because that would create a false sense of historic development. Um, any kind of cleaning would use the gentlest means possible. Um, also, uh, oftentimes it's best to have new additions be contemporary, compatible, reversible. Uh, once again, to avoid that false sense of historical development, reversible is a great quality for additions in order for future owners, if they do want to remove it in the future, it would leave the character defining feature intact. Um, any sort of words on a rehabilitation plan that say gutting, remodeling, sandblasting, those are key words um, that would need to be changed and updated um, by municipalities in order to ensure that the work um, is according to the rehabilitation standard. Ideal uh, aspects of rehabilitation plan, uh, focusing on rehabilitation plan and restoration rather than maintenance. A rehabilitation plan that is full of, full of just maintaining features um, isn't necessarily a great candidate for the Mills Act program. Uh, it, it should include substantial work, uh, infrastructure upgrades, seismic retrofit, roof replacement, all of these big ticket items are what cities want to incentivize to ensure that their historic resources stand for another 100 years. Um, uh, include scopes of work that reverse inappropriate alterations. Oftentimes, windows have gone through inappropriate alterations. For example, perhaps wood windows have now changed to aluminum or jealousy type windows. Um, so reversing those is a great aspect of a rehabilitation plan. Also ensuring that any type of rehabilitation plan spans uh, at least a 10-year period, thinking about how long things need to be done. Oftentimes, there's repeated items such as painting, if that needs to happen every seven to nine years, it might be in there twice. Unacceptable tasks. So uh, any kind of task that, um, you know, if a municipality, if they're asking themselves, should an owner be required to implement these tasks? Oftentimes those types of tasks are, shouldn't even be added. Um, so oftentimes those include um, new additions or alterations to building, uh, work that has been completed by a previous owner, if that's listed in a rehabilitation plan as an example of why they need to be in the in the program, that's sh that, that is not a, a good uh, that's not a good thing. Uh, any types of utility bills, security, housekeeping bills, all these things are commonly deleted. Um, those are are shouldn't prove 
necessity to be in the program. Uh, also any type of insurance, um, just because your insurance might be high, that, that may not mean that you should be in a Mills Act program. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, I, I have something. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we, as part of the Los Angeles uh, Mills Act program assessment, uh, we sent out a, a survey to many different municipalities. And I picked out four different municipalities from our survey just to highlight very quickly about how di different municipalities run their programs. So uh, I chose uh, from north to south, we have uh, the city of Eureka, city of Oakland, the county of Ventura, and the city of San Diego. And I'm sorry, these are not in the right order. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not gonna spend much time, I know that I don't have much time, but just highlighting um, the amount of contracts right in the middle of the spreadsheet, you'll see the city of San Diego has uh, over 1500 Mills Act contracts. Uh, and it, it has the most Mills Act contracts in any program in California by far. Um, the representations of about 100 contracts, that's, that's way more representative of Mills Act programs in uh, the state. Um, and then the city of Eureka is a great example of a smaller city that has historic uh, properties, um, but is still implementing the Mills Act through time. Um, uh, and last column, uh, assessor provides an estimated potential tax savings. That's a really interesting thing that um, not a lot of assessors will provide. Um, however, in uh, the county of Ventura and also the city of Eureka, um, the, the assessor will actually provide an estimate to an applicant about what their tax savings is, which I think is a great thing to do because uh, you know a, a property owner can estimate all they want to, but it may not equal exactly what their savings will be in the first year. And I'm gonna skip that. Uh, great. Um, uh, focusing on non-renewals. Um, non-renewals also are, are not something that happens very frequently. Um, it seems like the city of San Diego, they have a huge program. Uh, they have received both letters of non-renewal from their uh, participants in the program, and the city has non-renewed one contract. Uh, and as I said before, no contracts have been canceled. Um, uh, and I, I will keep going because I know that we are short on time. Um, I think this is really interesting of these of these four municipalities is that uh, the County of Ventura focuses on a full cost recovery of their Mills Act program. And there are fees for inspections. They are connect, co collected annually. Um, and uh, that's how they run their program, as opposed to actually the, the city of San Diego. Um, they do not track any fiscal data for their program. Uh, and they do, but they do charge a uh, periodic maintenance fees. So they're not sure if they are cost recovery, but they do collect fees uh, every five years. And that's according to their periodic inspection schedule. Um, uh, City of Oakland has a partial cost recovery. They do track uh, the fiscal loss to the city um, through communication with them. They have fees on their fee schedule, but they really haven't uh, implemented a mechanism to collect those fees. So although they have fees uh, written into their uh, uh, fee schedule for the city, into the contract, uh, they actually aren't collecting fees yet, um, just because there, there isn't a great vehicle to do that. And the city of Eureka, um, they're maintaining a very small program that they are really incentivizing more and more participation. So there are no fees to be part of the program at all, and they, they do not track the, the fiscal loss to the city. Or let's move through some valuation methods. So as we said before, there are three different values for a property once you're in a Mills Act program. Um, older uh, homes that have been purchased a long time ago usually do not benefit substantially from the Mills Act program. And that's usually because their Prop 13 value is so low that an income approach to valuation of the property uh, is higher than the Prop 13 valuation. And therefore, they're not going to receive a benefit from being in the program. Uh, it is beneficial for recent buyers uh, because their recent price uh, and the Prop 13 value, their uh, fair market value and the Prop 13 value are going to be pretty pretty equal um, because uh, of, of uh, the cost of purchasing a property. Um, from our research, it seems to have the most benefit for single family homes and condominiums uh, because they're typically not leased and they're typically an income approach to valuation isn't typically used to value those homes such as uh, industrial, recreational, commercial properties. 
Um, and that's what we found. Um, here is another example of a very uh, a large savings. Uh, we're talking about millions of dollars here in terms of difference of value. Um, and so just to highlight it, um, their taxes without a Mills Act are uh, you know, 136,000 with the Mills Act is 93,000. So their tax savings is 42,000. Uh, in our review of the city of Los Angeles, we found that about 13% of the program received no benefit uh, from being in the program. Out of the 930 contracts, 13%, um, they received no financial benefit. Um, however, of those that did receive a financial benefit, a substantial, it, it could go, you know, like I said, between 0% uh, percent, uh, to up to, they could be saving 87% on their taxes um, uh, uh, through being in the Mills Act program. Uh, as I said before, the assessor would choose the lowest of the three values and that would become the enrolled value uh, that receives tax that year. Uh, uh, last but not least, periodic inspections. It is required that municipalities uh, perform these in order to ensure compliance with the program. Uh, it, they recommend in the enabling legislation that they happen every five years quinquennially. Um, and also that a pre-approval inspection is conducted before a Mills Act contract is signed. Um, after inspection, some municipalities uh, um, provide uh, information to property owners about how they can uh, regain compliance with the Mills Act contract. Uh, oftentimes there is certain time limits on what they would have to uh, draft or provide the city in order to correct. Um, also, some municipalities require properties to self-report their work that they've completed that year, and then that's coded into the tracking for the compliance of that property. Uh, as I said before, we completed a program assessment for the city of Los Angeles. This is actually a hyperlink uh, um, to that uh, report that has a lot more information specifically about um, the city of Los Angeles how they run their Mills Act program and our suggestions for running their program in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nels. Um, looking at the questions, it seems like uh, your presentation has generated a lot of questions. So we'll be revisiting some of these things, no doubt, when we get to the Q&A. Uh, I wanted to um, jump into our last segment today, and that is a um, discussion a quick overview of the California Historical Building Code. Um, well, we like to think of this as a financial incentive because it's an alternative to the uh, regular building code and, and its intention is to provide a cost-effective uh, way for people to rehabilitate and maintain um, buildings. So just a very quick uh, run through of these, uh, just a few facts. The code is performance-based. Um, when I say the code, it is um, Title 24, Part 8 of the California Code of Regulations is the historic building code. So it's adopted by state by the state, and it is applies to all qualified historic buildings. We'll talk about that in a brief moment. Um, and it is um, enforced by the local jurisdictions, but in a in a way that is different than your than the um, regular codes are. And um, it the ultimate interpretation of the code lies with the State Historic Building Safety Board. There's really three parts to the code. It's the the uh, legislation, the code itself, and then the um, State Historic Building Safety Board and review any um, disputes on the interpretation of the code. It does not apply to new construction. That's very important. Um, some very important parts or aspects of the code is it does not require historic buildings to meet the same standards as new buildings, does not tolerate unsafe conditions. That is not its intent. It is meant to provide an equivalent level of safety while considering the historic features of a building. It is meant to make the building more useful without destroying it by uh, mandatory compliance with regular codes. Fire sprinklers are used in the building and, and uh, can, are often used for trade-offs for other um, typically required features of the, of the code. Um, one hour construction, fire rate construction, um, floor areas, et cetera. 
you get benefits of increase through use of fire sprinklers throughout a building. And um, another important feature is that they are exempt from compliance with the, the California energy codes. Um, we would really never suggest that you shouldn't comply and make a building more energy efficient, but you are not mandated to do so. So um, it is important to, to know that. Another um, important feature that owners should know is that its use is voluntary by the property owner, but mandatory by the local jurisdiction. In other words, if a property owner wants to use it, the building department must accept it and other departments, fire departments, et cetera. So, so it is, um, it's, it is uh, the local jurisdiction are required to, to use it when a property owner requests it. It's a performance-based document and qualified to sort buildings are not uh, required to meet the standards of regular codes. Um, you can use it in conjunction with regular code, but um, you're not required to, to use the regular code um, by, as your first uh, option by local jurisdictions. So you do have some alternatives. Um, it applies to all issues regarding compliance with the building code from use and occupancy, plumbing mechanical types of construction, and it is also unique and that it applies to open space or historic districts. So landscaping and site features are, are regulated by this code. Um, when one uh, uses the code, um, they are not required to upgrade other portions of the building uh, mandatorily. So it does not and should not trigger that. And there are a couple of exceptions, and that is for um, universal access, uh, disabled access, ADA, and um, a distinct hazard. So we'll talk about that briefly. Um, a qualified historic building is defined in the code that a uh, building uh, must be considered a qualified historic building in order to use it. This is the definition that is in the code. Uh, at the end of this, I have uh, links where you can find the code. You can get it online and, and take a look at it. Um, so it has to be one that a building that has essentially has is uh, sees some official recognition. It's not something that I think is important or significant or historic or your local landmarks organization. It has to have some sort of official designation or inclusion on a historic officially adopted uh, register in the area survey. Um, a distinct hazard is one of those those um, conditions where uh, you may have to make upgrades. Um, there's a couple of, of just obvious examples. The uh, uh, failing truss on the left is a distinct hazard. Something is failing, you gotta fix it. So you're required to fix it. Um, whereas the stairway that is non-compliant may not be a distinct hazard. It really depends on, on, on the use and the application, but by itself is not a distinct hazard that you must mandatorily upgrade. Um, the guardrail on the right could be a distinct hazard depending on the use of the space or the, the place. In a residence, perhaps not, but in a high use, high occupancy um, uh, use, it, it could be. So there is some uh, amount of judgment that must be applied here, but just as something to keep in mind. Where we see the code applied most, or in my experience, uh, I was a building official previous to my, my tenure here at CPF, is in handrails and guardrails and stairs and balconies. So these are just some, some examples. In a high use occupancy, you'd want to provide some compliant handrail. Um, it's on the left, you can see the, the historic rail is in place, but on the, the, uh, along the wall, there is a compliant or semi-compliant <laughs> handrail, uh, guardrail alternative in the second center um, picture. Um, and then on the uh, far right is a residence where you have low occupancy, you have people that are familiar with the surroundings and the risk is low. So that historic rail, um, you could make a case where you really don't have to, to make improvements to that. Other ways that we've seen it are in exiting. These are some, some examples that are a little different, but where the code was used to provide um, a second exit off of a, of a uh, second or third floor 
through the use of, of um, fire escape. And another way that it is used is in uh, adaptive reuse or conversion of one type of a building like a house to an office that might be situated close to a property line where the code, the regular code would require uh, uh, closing in those windows or putting in fire rated windows and, and uh, fire resistive, um, a fire rated wall, parapets, et cetera. What the code allows is for, um, for the property owner to use um, to protect those openings with fire sprinklers. So the, the point is, is that the code allows alternatives. And uh, this is an example of the uh, site um, conditions or, or, or um, codes, the section of the code that deals with um, site conditions and parking and landscaping, whereas police was, b, &B was required to put on-site parking that would have um, essentially meant paving over the, the yard and uh, they came up with a creative way to meet the code and still save their, their landscaping and historic features. So um, which is kind of in closing, the code really is a, it's a pretty small document compared to the other codes, but it, it um, really requires a dialogue between the designer and the property owner and the building department to be, I think, to be used successfully. Um, the important takeaway is that it exists and that it can be used by the property owner and its use is uh, applications mandatory by the local building department. So um, again, another whirlwind presentation, but I'm gonna stop there and John, we can open it up for questions. Okay, as a reminder, uh, you can use the Q&A box for questions. Please note that a lot of the questions have already been addressed by some of our panelists. If you click on the answered uh, button, you'll find the questions that have already been answered by text, but we can maybe provide clarity if you have any questions that follow up with that. Um, Heather, I think you had a question to get us going. We do. So our first question is, do you find that most cities offers mills, offer mills acts to properties that need repairs and require work plans before going into a contract? or to properties that have already completed renovations and want to apply for the tax benefit after? Uh, it's most often uh, provided to property owners that need to do work on their property. Um, uh, the, the city wants to make sure that it is maintained. However, there are standing rules within cities. Uh, I know that, for example, West Hollywood or uh, Santa Monica or Los Angeles in this region, recently completed work can be listed as a uh, example of a, um, the type of investment that the property owner has already put in the, into the program recently um, that they uh, would, would justify being as in, in the program. Uh, work that was completed a long time ago or uh, by a previous owner, uh, oftentimes uh, municipalities wouldn't include that as a reason why they should be in the program. Sorry, I was muted. Um, uh, and uh, there was a question um, about the uh, California Historic Building Code, Cindy, and this is about um, the accessibility and ADA requirements. And the question was, do ADA codes apply? Yes. In fact, there's a section in the Historic Building Code that really uh, requires that you first comply with the um, regular code, that is uh, the California accessibility standards first. And if you, if there is difficulty in complying and meeting the letter of that code, then you can use the alternatives in the California Historic Building Code. Um, when I was working in a building department, we were very careful with this. And uh, uh, we required that designers really had to justify this and to show how they couldn't comply and applied the, the provisions of the historic building code on a case by case, item by item basis. So you can use the code, but you first have to demonstrate why you can't meet the regular code. Okay, our next question. How do you monitor Mills Act contracts? Who does the verification of whether it is carried out per the 10 year plan? 
Can it be renewed by the property owner every 10 years with the same items or is it allowed to be changed and who monitors this? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, however, I am not a municipality that is maintaining or running a Mills Act program, so I couldn't give a, a complete answer to them because I don't know which municipality they are actually talking about. However, in my experience, um, it would be a new work plan of what the property owner plans to do at that property over the next 10 years. It could be some of the same items. You know, oftentimes historic properties, they need work that the property owner doesn't even know they need to work on. So, you know, in any given year, they might have to perform a substantial rehabilitation task that wasn't listed. And maybe some of the listed items get moved down in priority and that'll get pushed to the next 10 years. Um, so uh, I think that they should work with their municipality in order to uh, recreate a 10-year uh, plan that the city can use to come back in five years and say, okay, what can we check off this list? What, what are you in compliance on with this list? Um, and what how can we add to this list of what you did in the next five years? So it's, I, I think it's, it's a moving target um, and it's, uh, I think it just takes effort on both the property owner and the municipalities uh, and to make sure that these property owners have uh, certain rehabilitation items they're working on. Great, so there's a question from Greg. Uh, this is probably for uh, either Lauren or Mike. Um, how can a nonprofit owner of a registered historic building work with the developer to obtain a historic tax credit? Sure, so uh, those are more difficult projects uh, right now, currently with uh, the way the credit works, it has got has to be a sizable project for that to make sense. Um, you have to create uh, entities with tax liability within there. It is possible, um, but it is not if you, if the nonprofit actually owns the building now, like YMCA's have some of the most historic properties across the nation, they just can't use the credit. But if a nonprofit was interested in purchasing a, a historic building, you could set it up um, to, uh, to find the entity, to create the entity that, that has the tax liability to use the credits and bring an investor in. Um, but it needs to be a sizable project because you would, as you could imagine, there's a lot of professional fees um, related to doing that thing. Uh, we are trying to change the law with that, with the HTC Go Act to make it easier for nonprofits to do that. I'd love to talk with you and I'd love to help you reach out to your member of Congress to change the law. Thanks. <clears throat> And, and Lauren, I, I just mentioning Lauren, it seems like the route for nonprofits is a lot of these grant, grants that you mentioned as well. I mean, it, it, um, something that uh, some of these grants are specific to nonprofits, right? Yeah, nonprofits can can apply for a lot of those um, competitive uh, grants that I mentioned in the Historic Preservation Fund, um, SHPOs, TIPOs, and, and CLGs as well. Okay, our next question, is there a standard, met standard metric cities might use that indicates how much property tax the city loses by offering the Mills Act? Um, uh, I'll take that. Um, so I, I don't think there is a common metric. Uh, I, I think that, I, I think I, I just um, answer something similar. Um, cities can tabulate revenue loss, um, but they would need a substantial amount of data from the assessor, number one. Um, they would need an entire list of the Prop 13 values and the enrolled values for all of the Mills Act contracts uh, in their municipality for any given year. Um, so, for example, we worked with the LA assessor um, to get all 930 contracts for the year 2019. Uh, once we had that, you could get the sum of the Prop 13 values, the sum of the enrolled values, the difference between those values. Um, can then be calculated to determine how much tax savings was realized, or on the flip side, how much revenue loss was experienced. Now, another thing your municipality would need to do, they are only appropriated a percentage of that amount um, because that full amount goes to the county and then the city gets a, a is appropriated a certain ratio of that um, that actually goes to the city. So you would need to divide by the appropriation rate to get the actual amount of revenue loss for your city in any given year. 
um, but it, it would require a substantial amount of information from the assessor's office, uh, which can be hard to <laughs> sort through because cities often uh, track their uh, Mills Act properties by address and the assessor tracks by parcel and figuring out how many parcels are actually part of each address is very difficult. You have to merge and join a bunch of data so you get all the right parcels according to each Mills Act contract. Um, and, uh, but, but after you do it once, it's much easier. And then you can report on uh, the actual revenue loss. Just a quick hit, revenue loss is a great thing for a city that is putting that money into rehabilitation because rehabilitation is supposed to in incentivize, not pay for this. So they're actually spending a lot more every year on the rehabilitation on local materials, local people. Um, they're actually spending this money in your city. So the revenue loss that's experienced, typically um, the amount of money spent in the city is much greater. And I think we're about to close here, but I'll, I'll close with a closing question. Um, maybe a bit of a follow-up for uh, Mike here is, uh, can a nonprofit receiving an NPS grant go after, or maybe for Lauren too, but can a, a nonprofit receiving an NPS grant go after HTC with syndication? Is it possible? Well, uh, you probably have to talk to Lauren about the details of the particular grant, but yes, um, that is possible, um, but it would just be dependent on the what grant they're pursuing uh, and whether there are um, whether there are caveats with with that grant. <clears throat> yeah, I'd, I'd concur with that. Great. Well, we really appreciate everyone's time. It, it's been an excellent panel and thank you all for making the time today. Um, I will turn it over to Cindy in a minute here to close it out. I just wanted to remind people I'm pasting into the chat box a, a link to leave feedback about today's program and the series in whole. Uh, the, this is the concluding part of the series, but we will be providing the recordings to everybody after the program. We'll send you an email here later today with links to those recordings. And if you have any further questions, I'm sure we can share them with the speakers. Cindy, do you have anything else to say? I do. I want to say, uh, extend a, a really heartfelt thanks to, to Nels, to Mike, and to Lauren for, for taking your time to, to make this presentation. I think it was so very important. Thank you all. Thank you to our partners in Reading, Viva Downtown Reading, Shasta Historical Society, McConnell Foundation, John and Heather for, for working with us to do this. And I um, want to thank everyone who attended. Uh, a few things I want to remind you of is that, um, one, this is part of our ongoing um, program, our educational programs. We have offered a number of free programs um, over the past few years, really more than we've, we've done in the past, and we're very proud to do this and pleased to bring it to you at no cost. But we would also encourage everyone to support the work that we're doing by being a member or making a donation so that we can continue to do this. So I want to leave you with that. Also, uh, a heads up, because we're going to be moving back into the real world here, and um, we are planning our conference in April as an in-person conference, so we're going to be talking about some of these things that we, we touched upon today and some other um, issues and programs that affect all of us in this, um, this field, historic preservation. Say, uh, mark your calendar, April 19th through the 21st, 2023 at Fort Mason in San Francisco. Uh, we'll be doing an in-person conference followed by a uh, online portion. So it's gonna be a mix of, of both so that we can continue to reach people uh, if they can't attend in person. So again, thanks to all.